Comrades, on behalf of the African National Congress, we extend our heartfelt condolences to the Cuban people, to all socialists throughout the world, communists throughout the world. The, so, the left has truly lost a giant. And it's going to be very hard to replicate somebody like Fidel Castro ever uh, in our lifetime as it was very hard for us to replicate a Nelson Mandela. It will not be easy to find another person with the same values, the same human humanism, the same love for people, and the same commitment to eradicate dictatorship, to eradicate imperialism, to eradicate poverty wherever it reared its ugly head. And today, I firstly let me say, um, let me acknowledge all of you who are here. I, uh, I think Comrade uh, Solly has done a very good job. But let me um, say, Comrade Magama, Comrade uh, Masuku, Comrade Soli, and Comrade Cleva, as well as the comrades from the Youth League of the ANC, if you are here, YCL, I did see some, PYA, I did see PYA here today. Uh, and the comrades from Pudemo. But I also want to acknowledge Comrade Rax. Today on my email, uh, in the late afternoon, so he did this during the day, I think, there was a beautiful poem by Comrade Rax. And I hope that he will share it with all of us if, uh, if, it's, if it's allowed. It's, it's actually very beautiful. And I, and I hope you brought a copy with you. Oh, OK. Um, I, it's very hard. I, I was wondering, how, how do you describe a legend? How, how do you do that? Do you go to what other people said? Do you um, remember little things that you perhaps in your young life might have come across? Um, I, don't, I, did, I really didn't know where to begin. And I suppose that for many people, the emotion is so big that this tree is so huge. And when it fell, how do you take the branches of this tree and talk about it? But certainly, we must say that Comrade Com Commandant, El Commandant, El Chef, was a man committed to freedom. And he chose to be a communist, Comrade Soli. He made that choice. and. He also, at some point in his life, after he made that choice, said, you must not fear to expose yourself as a communist wherever you are. Don't hide behind other pseudonyms for being this thing called a communist, a person who loves other people and a person who wants to see equality and freedom and the right to choose that freedom for yourself and for those in your collective. And to understand him better, I think, I went to look at some things he might have said. I think that what impressed me when he came in 96, we were sitting as young cadre in chairs. We were told not to make a noise because Comrade Fidel spoke very softly. And there was a very loud interpreter. I remember that. Uh, very loud. He said one thing that has never left my mind. He said, you don't need a degree to press a button to industrialize your country. You need the commitment to do that. You need to have made the choice differently to the one that is chosen for you by monopoly capitalism. I've never forgotten that. And I, I, I wanted to say that for me and for many others, perhaps of my, of my young generation, um, young as well, I'm still a member of uh, the Young Communist League. They, uh, they don't know that. Um, <laughs> I think the other thing that strikes you about the legacy of Comrade Fidel is this word solidarity. You know, there's a story told by Shea uh, when they were arrested in Mexico, kept for 57 days. Uh, Batista's agents who were in Mexico had found them in a farm where they were training. 
57 days, they were about to do the big pushback into Cuba. And money and time was spent to release them. And Shea, because he wasn't a Cuban, was in difficulty. He was an illegal immigrant in Mexico. He had been found with arms, all manner of things. And they could not include him in the group of Cubans. But Fidel said, I'm not leaving you behind. And until you are released with us, we are waiting. And you see, that kind of commitment comes from somebody who understands the value of another human being. And I think that is the most precious thing that his legacy must give us as South Africans, is exactly that. But also some lessons that we can learn from the Cuban Revolution is that when you read through the many documents that are available to us now, remember that, <laughs> comrades, we only really got books about Cuba in about 1985, 86, when we started smuggling things from Harare, because it was all illegal. Uh, Progress Publishers books came and other documents that we could find. But some of the things that we were able to read and were asked to read was, what was the attitude of the Cuban people because they were in a capitalist system run by, for many, many centuries, actually. It didn't, the Cuban revolution did not begin in the 1960s. It began when there was a decision to make Cuba a country an agency state almost of the USA, you know. And people like John Quincy Adams and others even described Cuba as an, a, an apple from Spain that must belong to Uncle Sam, a strategic space for the American military to operate from. And the will of the Cuban people was to make a choice. And they chose the path of development, not of a market economy. That's the choice they made, not an easy choice. Because the minute they made that choice, the aggression against them began. Of course, like us, they did everything in the beginning with laws. Many laws were passed, different laws. But until the agrarian reform rules began and the multinational companies that held the resources of the fruit companies in Cuba in their hands, that's when the real aggression was shown. Then the laws on mining, then the decision about uh, the oil issues, and a real challenge to Gulf oil. It is then that what we call the big boys played their hands hard. And I think what is impressive about the Cuban people is that she, I think, and, and also Fidel describes it as People's Company Incorporated. We own our own resources. We own our own wealth. We are the masters of our own destiny, not somebody else. And I think, comrades, this is what we can learn from, this fear we have. Every time, comrade Soli, we use the word monopoly capital. Hey, people get very angry in South Africa. The media pounces on us and call us those in the ANC who are irrational and not the nice people. There are those, we are described like that. We are not nice because we are arguing. We cannot continue along a trajectory where our country's resources are owned not by the people, but by small groups of people. When we talk about beneficiation, then we get a very liberal perception of what beneficiation means. To some in our country, beneficiation means building some houses for the people in Marikana, building a hostel, where people can live. The reason I became involved in Tokoza, comrades, was the hostel 
on Kumalo Street. The worst enemy of our people was enslavement of people by the mining industry. And that has not changed yet. And we are not willing to take that fight to the door of the mining bosses. But the Cuban people did that. And what they had to do was sacrifice a whole range of things, including their major trading partners who, turned, who went away, who didn't want to have anything to do with this communist country, and Fidel was labeled a dictator. The very people who actually dealt with the dictatorship, the narrative turned on them. And he, even today, let me tell you, I was reading, please Google Fidel Castro, just do it for your own sake, and see what the media is still saying about him. Still now, after all the decades of all the successes of the people of Cuba, he is still described by the media as a dictator. Now, you see, the lesson we must learn is that lesson of patriotism, being true to the revolution that you must move forward with, not moving away when it gets hard, not running away when it becomes difficult, and never ever having a quiet conversation with the enemy and turning against your own revolutionary values. And when the enemy tells you that you are wrong, you say, uh-huh, yeah, we are wrong, of course we are wrong, we will go and correct. We must correct comrades, comrade Dada and others from the ANC. We must correct what is wrong in our organization. I agree and we all agree. But what we cannot be asked to correct is our values of transformation of this country. And actually, that is what is being asked of us. When people say the NC must self-correct solely, I am asking now, is that a modification of the values of the ANC? That people are saying, you know, if we, if we don't self-correct, then the rating agencies are going to rate us downward. You know? The Cuban people have not had banking facilities with the United States, France, and anywhere in Europe for decades. For decades, comrades. Because, why? Because you can't be seen to be associ associating yourself as a banking institution with that communist lot in Cuba. But what are the lessons then that are so hard for us to understand? I think that I just want to uh, uh, tell you one, read you one little thing that is said in one of the speeches. Fidel says, on the face of it, the new laws would improve people's living conditions a little and make things look honest. Because the demand was that the revolutionary government of Cuba must make the country honest. On the face of it, yes, clean everything up. But then when came agrarian reform and things became complicated, the United Fruit Company linked to the U.S. State Department saw that the Cuban leadership and, and, and we, were, we were serious to really improve the people's lives, not just talk, not just resort to demagogy. That's when problems began. And the concept of people's wealth, what do the people own? The property of the people was growing along with the government's room to maneuver and to change things. The real owners of the land were beginning to own the land and beginning to work the land. What are we doing? The minute we talk about agrarian reform, we say Zimbabwe. Hey, comrades, do you want to be like Zimbabwe? So say our people who write the stories. We have never said we want to be like Zimbabwe, but we have said that we have to reform 
the ownership patterns of the land in our country, and that must happen. And so when we say that, what's beginning to happen? The aggression is with us now. We are struggling. We are being beaten up. We are taking, but we are not taking the blows with dignity, comrades, you know? We are not, actually, taking the blows with dignity. We are going like this. Eina. The fact of the matter is that unless we do what the Cubans did and take the route they did and decisively do so and not talk half measures about the land question, it will not happen. Because every time there is going to be a, the question of land, people will go to the Constitutional Court or the Supreme Court in one or other and delay the processes done by our own hands. And what do we do? We don't argue for our own resolutions that we have taken in many, many conferences, many. And then what happens is, of course, we will have an argument that says, when I, uh, Jesse, you don't implement the resolutions that you take. Solly and I are in the Secretariat of the Alliance. We are very good friends, but we fight. <laughs> I have to tell you. Yes, I do. But we, we are the best implementers. But we are the best implementers. Ah, that That's we true. Say. We must say, even if we say it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So what we learn from Cuba is that the greatest challenge is always to remain true to the revolution. Because a monopoly capital will attack a country when they can no longer bleed it dry. They're going to come for us. Fidel, Fidel was very clear that anybody, you, you said, anybody who knows even a little about how these people act should have known for a long time the blow was coming sooner or later. The empire struck back. It was fated to come because the monopolies have never been known for fair play when they see that the possibilities ex for extracting money from a country are coming to a an end. They attack it militarily or economically. So comrades, he also says that some amongst us will speak for them, pretend to be a patriot, a revolutionary, a man of the left, but moderate. As they say, and betray all the people's interests. The Cuban people chose a difficult but just road, and the Cuban people supported that road led by Fidel. Fidel gave his commitment to the poor of the world and Africa in particular. Comrades, in 1975, I don't know how many of you were around then. I'm not sure. We were. <laughs> the moment that we started seeing body bags coming in to South Africa, and Tony Leon was the spokesperson of the South African Defense Force, said that the soldiers were bitten by mosquitoes <laughs> in Angola. We were really impressed with the caliber of those mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> but it opened something. It opened up the view that you cannot continue to destabilize the SADC region. You cannot continue along this way because we have a powerful friend in the people of Cuba. And indeed, it was a powerful friend, a friend who really the Quito Carnival victory is a victory for all of us, for all of us. And what we need to say tonight to our Cuban comrades is, we thank you and we thank Fidel and the collective. In 1990, when the first Cuban representative came into South Africa, the question was, what do you want us to do? We said we need doctors. Few months later, Cuban doctors arrived. We were able to send Cuban doctors throughout the country, and a concept of family health was developed, something our doctors were not trained. You treat the whole family, not just the sick person. Yeah? Comrades, we owe the Cubans a great deal.
We will never be able to repay Cuba, but we will always be a true solidarity friend with the people of Cuba. I also want to say to comrade, BDS comrades, you know, somebody asked me, why are you going there? Why don't you go to the city hall? I said, no, the point is that BDS carries the flag of international solidarity. And it is a true flag. We must take that flag and make sure that we really truly don't just talk about Israel and we analyze it. We're now becoming very analytical, you know. And the moment we are called anti-Semitic, semantic, we back off. We go and hide. I am an atheist. I cannot be an anti-Semite because I do not s subscribe to any doctrinal religion. My brother is the religious person in our family. <laughs> I give him that. But what we need to say very loudly, how long is it going to take to solve that issue of Palestine? When even ourselves are now beginning to debate it, mm. we are debating, comrades. Mm. We are no longer firm. Mm. We are no longer saying this thing must end. Now you have a Donald Trump. The right-wingers of right-wingers. Mm. <laughs> we will have a tougher moment, both for Sahrawi and for Palestine. Mm. And that means we must be stronger. We will have to be stronger. And we will have to say to people who say, you are anti the Jewish religion, that that is rubbish. And I'm saying that now because I want to tell you, uh, Comrade Mohammed knows, death threats, um, my email gets jammed because I get emails from a person called Israel Israel Stem, and many others. You know, that attack cannot stop us from having solidarity with the people of Palestine. We cannot stop. We cannot continue to watch as arms of prisoners are broken, as children are shot dead, and houses are collapsed with bombs, you know, and it's happening right now as we speak today. It's not like it happened the other day. And yet, in the United States, they talk about a road map, a road map to hell for the people of Palestine. So comrades, maybe in the legacy of Fidel, the monument, the monument we can give to Fidel now is to continue our solidarity movement here against the atrocities that are happening in Palestine. And let's not leave Sahrawi out. It's difficult there. Some of us have been lucky enough to go to those areas. Those camps are no joke. And if we think we know poverty here in South Africa, think again. You've not seen poverty. And you've not seen generations of children who look blank with absolutely no hope of where they're going to their future. And you see, what will we do? We will read the nice books. BDS produces the best. Uh, propaganda <laughs> <laughs> but we need more than that comrades honestly speaking it's not enough to wear the scarf even the EFF wears the scarf though though honestly to what commitment can anarchy have to the people of Palestine even Terra Licota wears the scarf but the point is, what are we doing? And I want to leave you with that question, just that question, to say we have to work. And that is our legacy to El Comandante. That's what we have to give him. Amandla. Amen.